This week marks one year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in the landmark Dobbs case, controversially and shockingly reversing 50 years of precedent to strip away what had been, up until that point, a constitutional right to an abortion. But see, the conservative justices in the majority of that 5-4 decision argued the Roe decision was, quote, egregiously wrong to begin with, because the Constitution never mentioned abortion. That meant it couldn't possibly be a constitutional right, and it must be left to the states. Doing anything else simply would be making things up, or as the phrase goes, legislating from the bench. And, you know, to hear Republicans talk of it, that's pretty much the worst thing a federal judge could do. Since the Reagan years, Republicans have agreed that judges should not behave as legislators. That's wrong. I felt the courts had sometimes gone too far in interfering with the constitutional prerogatives of other branches of government. The judicial branch interprets the laws, while the power to make and execute those laws is balanced in the two elected branches. Ronald Reagan made a boogeyman of what he labeled activist judges, Democratic appointees who he said were making, not interpreting, policy on issues like school prayer, abortion, and more. He warned that the judiciary, in particular the Supreme Court, was trying to stamp its own left-wing vision on America by doing what Congress could not or would not. Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, had the same concerns, and he helped push a GOP talking point that we still have to sit through decades later. What I would do is appoint people to the federal bench that will not legislate from the bench. The role of a judge is to interpret the law, not to legislate from the bench. President Bush will also continue nominating federal judges who faithfully interpret the law instead of legislating from the bench. One of our greatest problems in America today is justices that legislate from the bench, activist judges. Not legislate from the bench. Will not legislate from the bench. Radical judges who will legislate from the bench. Got that? No legislating from the bench. Now, the conservative supermajority on today's Supreme Court was appointed by the very presidents who railed against judges trying to make laws. So you would think that this majority would do everything possible to act with restraint, that they would avoid anything resembling a political power grab targeting other branches of government, that they'd steer clear of anything that might look like they were writing laws and thereby undermining the people's representatives in Congress. But of course, you'd be wrong because today's conservative Supreme Court justices are happily imposing their reactionary legislative vision on America, not just by interpreting laws, but by effectively rewriting them, inserting themselves into a role meant to be played by Congress in order to implement unpopular policies that could never get passed through Congress. Separation of powers be damned. In other words, they're doing what Reagan and his GOP successors railed against. Take some of the biggest, most divisive, most consequential issues in American life right now, things like climate change, voting rights, labor laws, and gun control. It's now the Supreme Court that decides what happens on those issues, not you, not me, not our elected representatives. And it's a dangerous and anti-democratic trend that I want to highlight today. Let's begin with our climate where the Supreme Court has twice undermined both Congress and the Environmental Protection Agency in just the last year alone. See, back in 1963, Congress passed the Clean Air Act, followed in 1972 by the Clean Water Act. Those laws gave the EPA authority to protect the environment by regulating air emissions and pollution in our waterways, respectively. But fast forward to today, and the John Roberts Court has basically said, nah, we don't like that with two landmark cases, West Virginia v. EPA and Sackett v. EPA. Let's start with last year's West Virginia decision. Legal critics called it an extreme power grab by the Supreme Court that threatens all regulation. In that 6-3 ruling, the court found that the EPA exceeded its authority in trying to regulate carbon emissions coming from power plants, stripping the agency of a major tool to combat climate change. In his opinion for the majority, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote, it's not, plaus it's not plausible that Congress gave EPA the authority to adopt on its own such a regulatory scheme. A decision of such magnitude and consequence rests with Congress itself. You know, like the Congress that passed the Clean Air Act in the 60s, giving the EPA the authority to use the, quote, best system of emission reduction. 
The justices in the majority came to their conclusion by invoking a weird new legal theory known as the Major Questions Doctrine, which requires an agency, a federal agency, to have clear and explicit authorization from Congress when tackling new matters of political or economic significance that arise, like, you know, the existential threat from climate change. But as Vox's Ian Milheiser points out, the Major Questions Doctrine is mentioned nowhere in the Constitution, nor can it be found in any statute. The justices made it up. For those keeping score at home, you apparently can't make up a legal doctrine to protect abortion rights, but you can when you want to stop the EPA from tackling climate change. Got it. In her dissent, Liberal Justice Elena Kagan explicitly admonished the court for stepping into the place of the legislature, writing, the court substitutes its own ideas about policymaking for Congresses. The court will not allow the Clean Air Act to work as Congress instructed. The court, rather than Congress, will decide how much regulation is too much. Now, keep that passage in mind as we get into the Sackett case from just last month. This narrow interpretation will remove protection for a majority of wetlands in the United States. Yes, not content to simply hobble the Clean Air Act, in Sackett, the justices weakened the EPA's ability to protect the nation's wetlands and waterways from pollution as Congress intended in the Clean Water Act. While the justices unanimously ruled that the specific plaintiffs in the case were not subject to EPA regulation, they split 5-4 in their precedent-setting opinion. Writing for that majority, Justice Samuel Alito said the Clean Water Act only allows the EPA to regulate wetlands that have, quote, a continuous surface connection to waters of the United States, like streams, lakes and rivers, making those wetlands indistinguishable from those waters. But here's the problem with that interpretation by Alito. The law applies to, quote, all waters of the United States and, quote, wetlands adjacent to those waters. But instead of applying the law as written to include wetlands close to U.S. waterways, Alito rewrote the law to only include wetlands explicitly touching waterways. That proved a step too far, even for conservative Trump-appointed Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who warned of real-world consequences and regulatory uncertainty from Alito's rewrite, telling his fellow conservative justices to, quote, stick to the text of the law. Meanwhile, Justice Kagan again admonished her colleagues for substituting themselves for Congress, repeating that exact passage we already heard from her in her West Virginia dissent, replacing just a single word to apply her opinion to the Clean Water Act rather than the Clean Air Act. So, you want Congress to decide how our air and our water are protected? Tough. The Supreme Court gets to decide that now. Now let's turn to voting rights, where in the last 10 years, the Supreme Court effectively rewrote the core protections of the Historic Voting Rights Act, the VRA, passed by Congress in 1965, and they did it in two major cases, Shelby County v. Holder and Burnovich v. DNC. A reminder. Congress passed the VRA explicitly to stop Southern states from disenfranchising black voters through the guise of seemingly neutral voting requirements like poll taxes and literacy tests. Listen to President Lyndon Johnson as he signed it into law. The heart of the act is plain. Wherever, by clear and objective standards, states and counties are using regulations or laws or tests to deny the right to vote, then they will be struck down. Congress didn't just stop at banning these measures. They forced these states and counties with a history of voter suppression to get approval from the federal government before they could implement any new voting laws. In other words, pre-clearance. It was such a crucial part of the VRA that decades later, Congress voted to extend the pre-clearance provision in 1982 and again in 2006, overwhelmingly. But just seven years later, in 2013, we get to the Shelby County v. Holder case. In that 5-4 decision, 10 years ago this week, Chief Justice John Roberts, in his infinite white male wisdom, decided that voter suppression laws weren't a concern anymore. Pre-clearance was effectively no longer needed in these states. As Roberts explained in his opinion, quote, African-American voter turnout has come to exceed white voter turnout in five of the six states originally covered by pre-clearance, with a gap in the sixth state of less than one-half of one percent. Well, well, problem solved. Clearly, we were finally in a post-racial society. But a funny thing happened after the Shelby decision. Here in 2012, you can see the numbers that Roberts mentioned. But look at what's happened since. The voter turnout gap is back. It's almost as if, stay with me, a shrinking turnout gap was not evidence of a post-racial society, but evidence that pre-clearance via the VRA was working.
The Shelby decision laid the groundwork for what the current 6-3 Conservative supermajority would do next to gut the Voting Rights Act. In Burnovich v. DNC, in 2021, the Navajo Nation sued Arizona, a state which had previously been covered by preclearance, over a new election law that clearly made it more difficult for Native Americans on reservations to vote. The 6-3 majority on the court recognized that this law imposed burdens on minority groups, but they upheld it anyway claiming the burdens of identifying and traveling to one's assigned precinct are modest when considering Arizona's political processes as a whole. Translation, states can pass laws that suppress minority rights. Just make it subtle. As Slate magazine's Mark Joseph Stern bluntly pointed out at the time, the Brnovich ruling meant equal access to the ballot was effectively dead. And as Justice Kagan noted in her dissenting opinion in that case, the court has yet again rewritten in order to weaken a statute that stands as a monument to America's greatness and protects against its basest impulses. So, you want Congress to protect voting rights to stop racist rules from suppressing minority votes? Tough. The Supreme Court is writing the laws now. In fact, let's look at labor law, where this anti-worker, anti-labor union court has legislated from the bench to create new rights for corporations and against their employees in two major cases. Janus v. American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees and Glacier v. Teamsters. See, in 1935, under FDR, Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act. It enshrined the right of workers to join unions and to organize orderly strikes. And to resolve disputes between workers and employers, the act also established the National Labor Relations Board. But nearly a century later, this court has hacked away at that system, most crucially in 2018 with the Janus case. Illinois state employee Mark Janus sued the state over mandatory union agency fees being deducted from his paycheck. Back in 1977, the Supreme Court under Chief Justice Warren Burger had ruled that arrangement was legal under the National Labor Relations Act. But Janus said that paying the union meant paying for political speech he disagreed with. And the John Roberts-led Supreme Court agreed, overruling that 1977 precedent in order to ban the collection of those union agency fees. The New York Times called it a sharp blow to labor unions. There is no sugarcoating today's opinion, Justice Kagan wrote in her dissent against the conservative majority. The majority overthrows a decision entrenched in this nation's law and in its economic life for over 40 years. By the way, that state employee who sued, Mark Janus, he quit his job, joined a conservative think tank and went on a national speaking tour. Go figure. And that was five years ago, before Justices Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, and before this month when the court struck another fundamental blow against the rights of workers to strike and to be defended by the government. That was Glacier Northwest v. International Brotherhood of Teamsters Local 174, a case in which drivers for a concrete company launched a strike and walked off the job, and the company sued them in state court for the cost of the concrete that didn't get delivered, some of which hardened inside their trucks. Were the strikers responsible? Well, for the past 64 years, workplace disputes like that have been up to the National Labor Relations Board to decide, as set out by Congress. So the Washington State Supreme Court tossed the suits and left the dispute up to the NLRB. But before they could rule, this Supreme Court took up the case. And in early June, they overruled the state courts and the NLRB, saying that the concrete company not only had a right to sue the strikers, they had a pretty good case. That's bad enough, but it gets worse. Only one justice dissented, Ketanji Brown-Jackson. What about liberal justices, Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor? The open speculation among multiple progressive court watchers like Ellie Mistal and Ian Milheiser is that they signed on to Amy Coney Barrett's anti-union decision in order to prevent Justices Thomas or Alito from assembling five conservative votes for their more extreme positions. So, if you want your vote to count on this court, you have two choices, it seems. Right or far right? Either one is a vote to water down the National Labor Relations Act, remove worker protections, and even overturn the Supreme Court's own long-standing precedents. Again, if you want Congress to protect labor rights, tough. The Supreme Court has other policy ideas. Finally, how about guns, where in the absence of much meaningful action by Congress, this Supreme Court has done more than any legislature or any other body in America to radically alter gun policy. In Washington, Chicago and New York State, over more than a century, lawmakers passed tailored local gun regulations 
And yet, in recent years, SCOTUS has just gutted those regulations in three big cases — D.C. v. Heller, McDonnell v. Chicago, and New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin. Let's start in Washington, D.C. In 1976, the nation's capital enacted a law banning handguns and requiring legal firearms to be registered. But in 2008, that was challenged by gun owners in the Heller case. In that case, five justices, including two of the court's current conservatives, struck down the D.C. handgun ban, saying the Second Amendment wasn't about colonial militias, but the right of the average Joe, apparently, to brandish a Glock. After retiring from the bench, Justice John Paul Stevens called the Heller ruling the Supreme Court's worst decision of my tenure. Then there's Chicago, where since 1982, lawmakers also required registration of firearms and routinely rejected handgun applications. Once again, firearm owners sued, with backing from the gun lobby. And in 2010, the court sided with them, ruling in McDonnell v. Chicago that the city's handgun ban violated the 14th Amendment, you know, the one that gave citizenship to freed slaves. Under the 14th, the court said, constitutional rights, including the right to bear arms, could not be modified by any state. Those cases and the election of Barack Obama motivated conservatives to press for new Second Amendment rights that never existed before. Warning shots, stand your ground, campus carry, open carry, constitutional carry. And in 2020, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association Incorporated versus Bruin, this conservative court stepped in where a divided Congress could not. You see, since 1911, after an especially grisly murder in Manhattan, if you wanted to carry a gun publicly in New York, you had to get a license and show proper cause. You had to prove you needed it. A group of Second Amendment folks thought that was unfair and sued. And this Supreme Court agreed, essentially creating a right to carry guns in public. In his majority opinion, Clarence Thomas said that Second and Fourteenth Amendments protect an individual's right to carry a handgun for self-defense outside the home. And no state could stop to ask them why they needed that gun. The Bruin decision was nothing short of seismic, The Atlantic declared in an article titled, One Nation Under Guns. Guess what the vote was? Yep, six to three. And in oral arguments, Justice Sonia Sotomayor summed up what made those three liberal justices so uncomfortable. The implications of a court stepping in on a state's legal turf. What it appears to me is that the history tradition of carrying weapons is that states get a lot of deference on this. I don't know how I get past all that history well, without just you sort of making it up and saying there's a right to control states that has never been exercised in the entire history of the United States as to how far they can go in saying this poses a danger. If a state allows open carry, then it can prohibit concealed carry, I suppose vice versa. But you're and asking us to make the choice for the legislature. But the six conservative Supreme Court justices disagreed and said that states don't get to put any real limits on gun ownership. Nope. States only get to put limits on really dangerous things, like voting rights and abortion. So you want Congress to stop mass shootings? Tough. This Supreme Court is calling the shots. Even as we witness more vigilantism, more threats of armed violence, this is one area in which you can actually see the damage being done in real time as the court legislates from the bench. But I do want to get back to what you just heard Justice Sotomayor say. But you're yeah. asking us to make the choice for the legislature. You're asking us to make the choice for the legislature. And that's exactly what this Supreme Court now does on a regular basis, on, on a range of key issues, from climate change to voting rights to gun control. It takes issues decided by the people's representatives and it redecides them in a manner that pleases the conservative supermajority on the bench. So an elected and Democratic Party controlled Congress can write and pass a progressive law, but an unelected and very conservative Supreme Court can just rewrite it confidently, brazenly, shamelessly. So let us be clear, this is not an impartial court, an independent arbiter of the law. This is now a radical and reactionary lawmaking body, a power-hungry and very partisan institution. These are not neutral judges, these are politicians in robes. Politicians, by the way, who you and I cannot vote for or influence, but you know who can influence them? 
right-wing billionaires who shower justices like Clarence Thomas. And also, as we discovered just this week, thanks to ProPublica's reporting, Samuel Alito, with expensive gifts and favors, with luxury vacations and trips on their private jets. Both justices deny that these gifts had any effect upon their rulings on the court. Sure. Today, the truth is that the Supreme Court of the United States is enmeshed in multiple major crises of its own making. A crisis of confidence, a crisis of ethics, a crisis of democracy.